Thank you very much for having me over here. And uh, thank you very much to everybody at the awards. Um, my name is Enric. I'm an interactive director. I've been working with Unit 9 for about eight years. I started making websites. Um, and as we saw some of these beautiful flash examples from the very early days, they quickly began to be replaced by video-based work. And, and so somebody had to figure out how to get the video into the website and how to make the code play nice with the video. And that was my job for a very long time, um, for better or worse. Uh, Unit 9 is a production company based in London, but actually these are the locations that we have across the world. Um, and we work on, uh, yeah, on a lot of sort of big brand-based projects, advertising, campaigns, etc. The main business of Unit 9, just like mine, has always been websites. Um, and slowly, as I said, that began leading into film. And the combination of film and websites is a very interesting uh, mixture. It's, it's storytelling in the film sense, and then functionality um, and interactivity, especially in the website sense. And those two elements combine very perfectly to start working on virtual reality. Because virtual reality in any kinds of form is in a sense a story that has an interactive component to it. It's not really very different from a website or from any other part of that, that world. I'm just grab some water. So it felt like a very natural progression to start at least thinking about how to construct a virtual reality story. And I began doing that about a year and a half ago. It took quite a while to get actually into production with something. Um, but I was curious about it. It's obviously been around for a while. Um, it's not something that is super new. I think these days I will certainly not be the only one talking about virtual reality. Uh, I think it's a big, 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 big topic that everybody's excited about and curious about and interested in. The big thing people always talk about with virtual reality is presence. It feels like you're really present inside of the story. It's because, very simply, you can look in every direction and the story is all around you. Um, presence is this feeling that you really traveled there, as opposed to maybe when you're watching a film, which is happening on a box, on your TV, or on your phone, where you're a little bit more distant. You remain in your world. The story is happening in a defined space. In virtual reality, the screen is on your face, and therefore the story is all around you. It's super exciting. Um, virtual reality is something which these days is part of Oculus Rift and, and Google Cardboard, but really it started with this guy here. I had the, the wonderful opportunity to meet him, Mark Bolas. He's been working on virtual reality since the 80s. He started working with NASA in the very early days. Um, Palmer Lucky, who began Oculus Rift, was his, his laboratory assistant. Uh, that takes nothing away from, from, from Palmer. But Mark, Mark Bolas has been doing virtual reality and building open source VR headsets for a good 20 years. He, I don't believe, at least he, he claims to be the, the human being that has spent more time in virtual reality than any, any other human being. And, uh, and I, I, I can imagine knowing, uh, seeing, seeing his passion and, and knowing the, the, the work he's done. Some of the key challenges with virtual reality are very, very simple. I don't think, I mean, this is not my knowledge, these are the things that I read about and I, I hear about. You can't control where people are looking, so if you're telling a story, that, that's interesting and complicated at the same time. If you don't know whether your viewer is looking at that one moment that is absolutely key in your story, how do you know that they didn't miss it, and therefore how do you know that they understand what you were trying to communicate? As a, as a filmmaker, let's say, or as a, as a writer, how do you know how to orchestrate your story if it's happening in every possible direction? So really, even from the writing process, script writing all the way through to planning, to, to, to developing your project, you've got to be thinking, and, and again, this is just like any other part of, let's say, web development. You have to be asking yourself, what is your viewer doing? What are they seeing? What are they feeling? What are they thinking? And you have to react to that in the best way that you can. In some projects, that's much more easy. In other projects, that's more difficult. It depends a little bit on what you're doing. Um, obviously, you have films. That's the 360-degree film type of virtual reality experience. Or you have a, a game, which is an engine. And that's dynamic. That's completely changing all the time. 
Um, those two types of projects have very different properties, but the essence is the same. What is the person in your story doing at any one moment, and how can you pr try to predict that, to try to make the experience the best it can be? Uh, Unit 9 as a company has done quite a few virtual reality projects that I wasn't directly involved with, such as Mini Stories, which is a series of film noir projects um, uh, for, for Mini, for the car. The World Within, which is a beautiful drone, 360 drone film experience for the Tourism Board of Canada, where you fly around the beautiful nature of British Columbia and you can learn about the wildlife and about the nature and about the beautiful mountains. Uh, spectacular work. This really crazy Five Gum experience where they created 3D worlds that were inspired by the flavors of the gum. And you were kind of suspended, this was in Berlin, this installation, in, in like a shipping container, and you'd be hanging from wires, and then you could sort of explore those 3D gum-like worlds, and all kinds of wind and like sounds and stuff. It was like close to torture, I think, but, but exciting and interesting at the same time. Um, and, and a Formula One job where you can be Jensen Button and drive a Formula One car. It's a really interesting example of the most obvious um, thing that you would want to do immediately when you start thinking about virtual reality is, oh, well, I can be like a, I can be in some button, I can be in a Formula One car, I can see what that's like, I can see the world from his perspective. Um, I've worked on three, I've worked on a few more, but, but there have been three main virtual reality projects this year, in, in, in last year, in, 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 in 2015, that I've really focused on. And, and um, I have to be honest, um, I, I've definitely made plenty of mistakes in that process. It's been a process of falling down and getting up again. Um, and, and I want to share with you guys just a little bit of um, what happened and how it happened and, and the mistakes that I made and how, and how I kind of figured them out going forward. And that's obviously with a team in every, every single case. The first project I began working on is um, Lexus Elevate. So I was working with um, an agency called Team One on an idea to create a cycling film, a cycling 360 film. And we ended up working together. A lot of the pixels there are part of this glitching effect, so that's not f streams of birds, although that would be pretty beautiful. If it had been, that would be really, really amazing. Um, so we were in Malibu in California after much talk, like three months of, like I was pitching for this project for about maybe a month and a half, trying to explain what we could do and how it could work. And then finally they went, all right, let's go, let's go for it. And we had a month or so to prepare. And then finally we were in Malibu in California for three days up in the mountains um, with a professional cyclist called Christian van der Velde, who is an absolute legend um, and ex-world champion, um, pretty hardcore guy. And he used to spend his early days when he was younger, when he was training to be a pro cyclist, he was up in those same mountains, just on his own, just with his bike, you know, just for hours on end, just going forward. So we spent three days with Christian and we rigged all kinds of crazy camera uh, setups to his bicycle and to him, and then kind of said, all right, off you go. And then he would go off for 10 minutes and ride down a mountain or ride up a mountain and then we would take the camera off again, and then there you go. And um, on one hand, you want to create a film which is very smooth and steady. One of the, the very easy things... Why do I not have sound? No. I don't have sound, guys. I don't know why. One of the very, uh, very, very important things about VR is, is everything has to be fairly steady. Because the screen is on your face, because you're very close to it, a little bit of movement and, and, and jumping about will create a sense of nausea, will get you sick. So putting a camera onto a bicycle isn't, isn't the easiest thing in the world. Um, and, and then secondly, the other challenge that we had is, is what happens if the camera falls off? So on one hand, the, the rig had to be pretty sturdy, and actually it did fall off a bunch of times. Um, because Christian doesn't go slow. He's a professional cyclist. So those, those, yeah, that was pretty interesting. It's a beautiful environment to be in. It was also 
um, pretty harsh and unforgiving. The, uh, the temperatures were, went up to a good 40 degrees in the daytime in the heat and the sun. And uh, it, was pretty, um, yeah, it was pretty hard work to try to keep all the equipment cool. One of the funny things that happened on that project is that two things happen very easily with GoPro cameras especially. This is a little detail. I'm not, it's, the, the heat causes them to, to, um, to, let's say, to warp. And so elements in the camera warp, and then it seems like your batteries are lower than they really are. The, 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 the battery levels are lower than they really are. The other thing that happened is we had the, the lenses of the camera moving and twisting because the body of the camera was increasing in size very, very slightly due to the heat. And that would cause the focus ring to move and pull. Very complicated stuff, very, very strange. Little problems to deal with. I'll um, play you guys a little uh, video, but basically the whole experience is based on the idea that Christian is riding around the mountains. He's thinking about what it is about cycling that got him excited. He's explaining what is uh, difficult about being, being a rider, about being out there. Yeah, I'm not sure it's, I, I can, there we go, you managed to fix it, well done, thank you so much. Um, he's thinking about the early days of being a cyclist and, and the sacrifices that he had to make, his family had to make for all the long hours, the, the, the traveling. He said, something, he was, he's out, he's traveling for six months of the year and he's been doing that for, for 10 years. So the impact on his family. So it's a very meditative film. It's a film about, it's very introspective. It's a film about him and his thoughts and him alone. I'll play you a little video of, of the experience. When you do go 100% commit to something, that's a reason why people like to do what we do. Because it's, you're 100% committed, there's nothing else that's going on. There's only one thing that exists, and that's riding your bike. So obviously that was a kind of uh, 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 an example of the perspective that you would have inside a 360 film. We rendered out a version of what it might look like if you looked here and there and there, but really you could look there and there and here if you wanted to. Um, the shooting process was weird and strange and fun. We had, we had police troopers on the set to kind of block all the roads and then Christine would go with this crazy contraption and then we would literally be lying in the bushes with, this is not me, this is a picture from the internet, but we would be lying in the bushes with camouflage gear because, you know, it's a 360 camera. I mean, you can't just stand around on the sidelines. You're gonna be in shot. Um, so yeah, really funny. Um, stitching together six videos taken by different cameras, all positioned in a circle, kind of. Um, it's pretty tricky we discovered that it's pretty tricky. I have to say um, hats off to my team because when you start scrubbing through it, you realize small little things like the yellow line on the middle right center of the screen, it's completely broken up. And, and the way it's broken up, it's moving across frames. So, and that happens all over. Every single stitch line needs careful attention. And because we were kind of making up our camera rigs, our fault, you know, if you take a standard camera rig that, that's off the shelf, then there's stitching software that knows exactly the position of the camera, so it just kind of works. But we were like, nah, we'll take a camera on his helmet, one there, one there, one there, it's gonna be fine. And uh, so yeah, there was a lot of time spent in After Effects sort of stretching and, tw and tweaking and pulling, pulling bits of video from one direction to another to make those lines perfect. Um, so, uh, for every project I'm going to show you, I've got a couple of lessons that I learned in the process. The first question is, who is the viewer? And who is the viewer is, a, is obviously a story question, it's a conceptual question, but in this case it quickly became a technical question. Our, our key shot was going to be Christian's first person POV. Um, but, but if you think about the fact that, okay, you are the camera, so this is important, you are the camera in 360. In normal film, we tend to forget that the camera is there, and then you start getting all these amazing visual effects, shots like this one, 
But if you're in VR, the bullets just went through you. So you're dead now in this particular story if this was VR. If you are a Christian, that's cool, that's possible, there's no bullets, so that's fairly easy. But one of the weirdest things that we kind of experience there is if you have first person POV, what happens when you look down? We can put a camera on Christian, we can't put it in his head obviously, but we can put a camera on Christian, you saw the helmet earlier. But what happens if you look down? I mean, our body, we can look down, but we can only go so far. We can't look inside of ourselves. But if you're filming 360, well, it's 360, you can look down. So you get this weird body without a head, which is just kind of ruins the story, you know? Like, that totally takes you out of the fantasy. So although we you know, had that as a plan initially, we decided instead to kind of improvise and, and film a helmet separately and, and composite it in there just to take away that weird feeling that, this is, that Christian doesn't have a head in this particular film, which is a bit strange. So there's a helmet being filmed uh, from all angles for the shadows so that we could ap apply it to different lighting conditions and then you composite a helmet on top and uh, a little silly little detail is important is you realize in the process, every time that you make a mistake like this and then try and fix it, you don't think ahead far enough about the consequences of your, your decision because you're not really, um, you're just trying to fix the problem, right? Oh, weird stump, what are we gonna do? We'll put a helmet, okay, it's gonna be easy, we'll put it. The human head moves at a different bounciness, level of bounciness from the body. So, and then you have, so depth of field is one thing, but we had to kind of figure out and offset the level of bounciness of the helmet to make it look like you're not looking at something that doesn't fit and doesn't feel right. It's, it's very interesting how the real world is infinitely complex and how recreating the real world in any little detail, it's, it's hard work. Um, the second thing that I learned on, on Lexis uh, is, is really a, about the fundamental question of virtual reality and, and, and it's true for interactive storytelling as well. It's about losing control of your story. So uh, we wanted to have a story, uh, but ultimately it's for the viewer, right? VR is about the viewer and about the, maybe the game player and their, and their ability to be in that world. So I did have a basic storyline in mind. I had the challenge, I had warming up and, and, and then anticipation building in the film and then the competition element where two other writers suddenly join Christian and you're not sure if they're competing or if they're friends and then finally there's a victory, they reach down to the bottom of the, of the road. And, and so it's an interesting balancing act between trying to enforce a story onto your viewer and yet creating the space for them to be able to have their own experience. Um, it's hard to write that, it's hard to predict how it'll work. It's definitely a learning process for me and, and I think um, it's true probably for the whole VR industry. Everybody's trying to figure out, well, what is it really? Is it a story or is it just an experience? And is the viewer in control or is the director or the scriptwriter in control, I think it's always a little bit different. Uh, one little tiny note afterwards, what you would ask why does Lexus want to make a cycling film? Everybody asks me that question. Lexus invests a lot of money in cycling. I, I think they just really love cycling and I figure maybe amateur pro cyclists maybe have the money to buy a Lexus, but, but they're a very, very big part of the cycling scene, especially in let's say Los Angeles. Um, so from their perspective, the cycling world is a, is a, is a good market to, to be involved with. Um, the second project I've been working on that is an ongoing job is Storm. And that's an in-house built uh, a VR game and it's all about survival. It's um, Storm, so you're in a storm. And it's a snowstorm and you gotta get warm or you will die trying. That was the idea when I started. This is one of the concept images that I, I, I made early on. The idea started because I was online late at night on YouTube, just going from link to link to layer to layer. And I found this beautiful video of, it's a bit pixely, so ignore that, but of a snowstorm in Canada. And it's basically just white, and then you get a couple of silhouettes and a couple of shapes, and I thought that was really compelling. And actually, secretly, deep inside of me, I also figured, well, that would make it kind of easy, too. Like, we can just focus on the experience, but not have to worry too much. This is a 3D game, so not have to worry too much about all the buildings and the rendering and the grass and the trees. Like, it's a beautiful, aesthetically simple environment, so it's a beautiful space to play within. Um, so I'll play a little bit of the, the, the trailer, which uses real gameplay footage. 
you'll notice that there really isn't that it's much to look at. God, it's cold. I don't know which way to go. Which way do I go? Okay. And every... Everything looks the same to me. I need to get out of here or... Gonna freeze to death. I will not die out here. It's pretty hardcore. Um, so yeah, it's as simple as that. You walk around a snowstorm and you gotta find a way into the building. And it works on, on Oculus Rift and Vive. We're gonna be releasing a new version in a few in a few weeks. I think we're meant to be releasing it now, but we're not done yet. Um, we, you know, we worked on a very simple environment. There's one building which has got a beautiful, warm light, glowing light from inside of it, which is, you're immediately attracted to. People have said when they play the game, they feel really, really cold because the sounds are really cold, which is exciting. Uh, it's a very ba basic, simple puzzle mechanic. And uh, you've got to pick up the pieces, and there's a few different ways into the house, but you've got to figure it out. Slowly, as, as the game progresses, you've got five minutes. As the game progresses, you, your movements get slower and slower and slower, because you're freezing to death. Fun. Uh, we've uh, been looking at simple things, motion capture, just making the movements very lifelike and very realistic, which is fun. The, the big question really for me that I, I'm trying to retrofit into the project because I spent so much time building the game and then working with my team obviously and, and figuring out the mechanics and the puzzle is why are you doing this? And, and in, I think in VR projects more than in any other, especially games, websites, it's true for all those projects, but in VR it's important to answer the question of for the, for the, for the player or, the, or, the, or the, the viewer, why are you doing this? And, and you have to give them a motivation because it's actually really hard work. Like, you're in a headset and you're moving around 360 to see the back and then forward again. And it's not all happening in front of you with just a mouse or a trackpad. It's everywhere and you're doing all the work. So you've got to have a real motivation all the way through to be, uh, to be active in that game. Um, and people get tired, you know, five, five minutes in a VR game like this one, which is quite intense. Um, it's, it's, quite in, it's quite hard work, I think, for audiences. So that motivation at the very beginning is extremely important. Um, People need to feel like they're not just uh, performing a series of tasks, but there's a, a story behind that task, a purpose behind that task. And, and, and this was the hardest lesson, I think, to learn, is if you write your story, really, your, your, your story is half the job. Whether it's, uh, whether it's more functionality-based or a script for a film, it's half of the project. If you try to figure it out while you're building it, you, you're, doing, you're doing twice the work. So you're going to want to do that first, and I did not. And, and, and it's, it's hard work to retrofit a story into a game that's already half-built. Um, we are looking at finishing the next level and then maybe doing some other survival experiences like in the desert or maybe falling from a plane. Anything that feels like you are about to die, basically. <laughs> the third and last project to go through um, is a VR film about water poverty. Completely different subject. Um, and I made this with Mother London. Just launched last week at Sundance. We were in Honduras in October. Stella Artois has a project uh, running where if you buy these special beer glasses, the money that you spend on those beautiful special beer glasses goes to a charity called water.org who provide clean running water in the homes of people in rural countries like Honduras. We traveled there with about five flight cases of equipment, which was in insane, to try to make this 360 film for them and, uh, and, and try to tell the story of what the difference water really makes. It's such an obvious thing. We all have water. I've got some right here. It's easy. If you really have to work for your water, then life all of a sudden becomes a lot more difficult. It's not uncommon in the world for women and children uh, to take up to four or five hours a day just to get, cl get relatively clean water into their home. That means walking to the, wa to the well with a, with a thing like this, filling it up, going back, and then going, and then again, and then again, and then again. Um, it was a pretty humbling experience to be there and to see this, some amazing people that we met. I think you, you, um, you can't quite imagine a place until you go there. Um, um, it's, it's, uh, it's a beautiful, stunning world, and, and obviously the big difference that water makes is very clearly evident when you, when you travel to places like this. You can see the difference, especially 
for children and in particular young girls who, who often become a part of the household at a very young age and can't go to school, for example, having water in the home helps with that issue. We made a lot of new friends along the way also. Um, one funny thing about VR filming is that you see a scene, these g cows were coming up the road with, with a guy who was tending them, and you go, oh, this is amazing, we should film this. And it takes about 15 minutes to get the camera up, so you have to keep like 25 cows, you know, from, and with a guy, and can we please can you wait, can you make them wait? It's not just snap and go, it, it takes quite a bit of time. The fundamental mechanic for this film was um, a split screen idea. So, okay, 360, great. You have the whole thing around you. What if you do two times 180? It's an interesting idea. You see w with water on one side and without water on the other, the same person, the same woman, but different times in her life, different, mom different moments in her life. I'll show you the full 360 film because I don't have one of those fancy ones where the camera moves. So this is the full 360 canvas. Mi nombre es Guillermina Hernández Hernández de Comunidad She used to walk from there, from her home down to the river, five or six times a day. It doesn't seem far, but we did it with, uh, with our crew and they didn't want to go back after the first time. Seriously, it was intense. The heat and, and, the, and, and the surface is really irregular. It's really hard work. And all of us have all these fancy hiking boots and she just has flip-flops. The transformative effect of water is huge. It isn't just your daily life. And it isn't just school or going to school, but it transforms the whole community. Because suddenly people have time to do things like make extra food, which they can sell in the town. So again, the idea being two 180, two, two 180 domes stuck together gives you a perspective of no water and water. And, and how does that feel as a comparison? It's definitely a little bit of a gamble. It's something that's easy to pitch as an idea, but then you have to make it. When we went there, it was much more difficult in the environment we were in to find perfect scenes where everything would be aligned, where the line doesn't become something you get distracted by. Um, the looking around thing, it's interesting. I, I, I mean, it's an experiment, and I don't know. I mean, I welcome anybody's thoughts on it. This is on YouTube 360. Um, it's an interesting idea, and, I, and it's very hard to know in, in, in virtual reality films whether ideas like that are, are trying to, f to fit an old idea of film into a new technology, or if they actually work as a mechanic to explain what having water means to people. Filming some of the drone shots was, uh, again, was funny. It's, it's just like with Lexus. We weren't maybe wearing camouflage here, but we were certainly hiding behind bushes and trying to be invisible. And then these drones are pretty noisy. You can see the guys. Oh, this is me, actually, if I remember correctly. Just kind of crouching behind something and 
hoping the drone doesn't see you, otherwise the post team has to edit you out. Um, but we did get that beautiful shot of the football. That noisy drone going over the football was tricky. We had to tell those guys, please keep playing football, don't pay attention to the drone. Um, and it's not easy for those, for those guys. They, you know, they were just there with all this weird equipment. Um, the first lesson is in VR, there's no behind the camera. And, and that's exactly the point I was making about hiding behind the bushes. Every film you've ever seen has a camera in it. Every shot in every film you've ever seen has a camera in it, and we tend to forget. Um, in 360, that's not the case. The camera is pointing in every direction. And it's super weird. You're putting a camera up, okay, so far so good. That's normal. And then, if you look at the camera's perspective, what happens is the camera guy runs off. All of us are hiding over here in the, in the, in the top, like where he's going. We're all hiding behind rocks and, and bushes there, trying to sneak a peek. And then what happens is that, that our, our, our subjects come down. Uh, uh, we have Geremina with her son and daughter coming down to do the scene, but we can't see it. We don't have a clue what we've really recorded. We don't even know if the cameras are still running at this point. Maybe the water has swallowed them all up. You can't be in the shot. You need to be far away. There are technologies that allow you to do like live previewing over wireless networks, but you're in the mountains in Honduras. I mean, it doesn't really work. That technology isn't yet stable enough for that, that to be a viable option. So this is a great quote, I think, that sums up that particular lesson. It's, if you look at normal documentary filmmaking, you try to find a corner, you hide, and you observe the world, and then you capture something beautiful. In, in the case of VR, it's, you're just setting a trap. You're just le letting your camera be, you're running away, and then you come back and you hope you found something good. The second lesson, I think, with, with VR generally, maybe a lot of people are having that issue if you're making VR. Emotion is actually really hard to capture. Um, you don't have close-ups, you don't have depth of field, you can't cut to a beautiful shot where you get you know, the father doing the, the oranges with his, his knife and being emotive and being, being, being present. It's difficult to get that level of quality that we have come to expect from films or, or even photographs. Even to the point of going much, much closer and really seeing the water and, and different frame rates. You don't have the technology that the film has to create the language that we associate with beauty or with passion or with depth of feeling. Um, the VR world is very excited right now. Everything is the most emotional and the most immersive. Um, but I think it has some ways to go in terms of really creating the power that we are used to, just like Werner Herzog is saying here, cinema is the most intense way to express our inner condition, our feelings. And VR films, it's true, it transports you somewhere. It's the idea of presence. So it's definitely a very, very powerful medium. But it isn't yet transporting you, I think, into the minds of your subjects. It's difficult to get close to people. Um, I have a little video here, but I'm that I'm gonna you play you, which is quite funny, but I'll skip halfway through it because the time is getting tight. Okay. <laughs> it was definitely a really crazy place to bring this equipment, and um, we are forever indebted to two different uh, groups of people, the people that hosted us and who are part of our film which are people we just found when we were there. We spent a few days interviewing people. And secondly, the translator that traveled with us. I had never imagined that a translator could be so instrumental, but it was really the key to make the whole project work. Our camera crew, as you can see here, are professional camera people. They have their process and they have their equipment, they have their things. Um, this is just a funny video that collects all the claps that you might get to sync up the cameras. But the translator provided a bridge between these guys and, and, uh, and everybody who lived in the village where we were filming. And, and that bridge was so essential for them to understand what we were doing and what they were a part of. It was an absolutely crucial um, process. And it kind of sounds a bit obvious when I say it, but, but he had to be so sensitive to their needs and to, uh, to the way they were, were responding to our presence. Because VR filmmaking is an extremely disruptive kind of filmmaking. You're in the middle of their house, right there and everybody has to wait and everybody has to hide just like we have to hide and the whole village was disrupted for three days so that that involvement from from a translator to explain things like that was was really key so
So very quickly on the future um, of VR, I'm certainly only beginning to learn about it. VR is very different from cinema or photography. Uh, narratives are going to have to evolve to, to accommodate it, and maybe there'll be a whole new different kind of, of uh, filmmaking coming out of that. For the moment, I think even myself, often we're just putting traditional ideas of film into this new medium, and it has some ways to go, and that's also technical, because how is the work that we're doing today going to be future-proof? In two years' time, if anything, resolution will have tripled, but also the technology will have changed fundamentally. The true power of VR, which is what people are, like even Mark Bolas is aiming for, is that VR is something, it's a story which knows you're in the story, which isn't just happening and you happen to be able to look around, but the story is reacting to you, it knows you're there. Characters know you're there. So that means combining 360 VR film with a game engine and literally playing film inside the game engine. It sounds a bit crazy, but it's true. Take something like a hologram. This is a, a film which has been a film of a woman been turned into a 3D model. And because she has a whole range of actions, she can start to look around you. Because she's been filmed from every possible direction, she can be placed inside of, a, of, a, of an environment and react to the, to, to the person experiencing that story. That's it. Thank you very much, guys.